Hello everyone, it's Jason from Skinny R&D, and this is a little project of mine I've been working on. It's a lens detector. You can find these all over the internet. These are sold to find like hidden cameras inside of dressing rooms or bathrooms, but they operate on a very simple principle. What you do is you take, you look down the site, you look around the room. If you see a reflection from a hidden camera lens, it'll blink back at you. Uh, pretty simple device, but you'll notice that it's blinking. And that blinking is because of a chip that's on board called the 555 timer. So today what I want to do is take some time to talk about the 555 timer and how to set it up and how it operates and works. Got a paper bag here ready to go and let's get to it. Okay, really quick, this is future Jason and I just want to insert something. Sometimes I get right into the teaching not telling you exactly what we're going to be talking about. So what a 555 timer does is it's going to output a clocking signal. So I made a little drawing here for you. So what happens is over time on one of the pins of the chip, what you get is you get a voltage out that goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. What we're going to do is we're going to play with this chip. We're going to add some hardware to it. That way we can adjust this output waveform to go up and down as frequently or as infrequently as we want it to. So it might can turn something on, then turn it off, then turn it on or turn it off, or you can keep time with it. That's what a 555 timer does. Back to past Jason. Okay, first thing, this, this is a 555 timer. It's an 8-pin chip, and what I've done is I've taken the data sheet and put it down here. So, if we were to look at the 555 timer, that would kind of be the orientation. Notice it starts with pin 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. All right, first thing we want to do is take a look at the inside of this thing so we kind of get an idea of what's going on. Uh, we have two comparators here and uh, comparators have usually two inputs. They're labeled V plus and V minus. The way a comparator works is if the voltage that's coming in on V plus uh, input is higher, then the comparator outputs a one. If the voltage on V minus, if it's higher, then the comparator outputs a zero. So there are two of those in here. Also another thing, there are three resistors. They are all the same value. Uh, from what I heard, they're all 5K, and that's where you actually get the term a triple five or 555 timer, or those three uh, resistors right there. The next thing worth noting is the flip flop here. The way a flip flop works is you have a, an R pin called reset, and you have a set pin, S. When R equals zero and uh, S equals one, then your output from the flip flop is one. When R equals one, and S equals uh, zero, then the output of the flip-flop is zero. This uh, third input here is just a master reset, and it's actually a reset to reset the entire 555 chip. So let's hook this thing up. The first thing we wanna do is hook up uh, pin eight and pin four. In the example I'm gonna be using, I'm gonna be using a nine volt battery to power the 555. You can use a pretty wide range of voltages on the 555. I think it goes up to 15 volts. So we're just going to use 9 volts, so we want to hook uh, 9 volts up to pin 8. Uh, we also want to hook that same 9 volts up to pin 4. And then we want pin 1 to go to ground. So the way this thing is going to work is you can use it in two modes. You can use this in a mode uh, that's called um, a stable, which we're going to be using, and you can use it in a mode called mono stable. A stable is a mode where your output is going to be some uh, some square wave, some clock signal, okay, to where it's turning on and then off, on and then off, on and then off. Okay, so that's A stable. Mono stable is when you want this to uh, fire on, you activate a trigger that is on pin two. We're not going to really be using mono stable uh, in this example. We're going to be using a stable mode to show you how to make a clock. So in order to operate in a stable mode, in order to make this uh, clocking output, then you have to have some supporting pieces of uh, hardware. It just can't happen with just the chip alone. You have to have a few other things. To make this a little bit more understandable, um, we're going to hook pin 8 up to that 9 volt source. So you'll have 9 volts going into that. 
The next thing we're going to do is off of pin 8 is to drop a resistor in and hook it up to pin 7 and this resistor is going to be called RA. The next thing we want to do is take and put in another resistor and this is going to go to pin 6 from 7. So this is going to be resistor B. We're going to call it RB. You are also going to need a capacitor. This capacitor will come off of pin 6 and go to ground. And there's one other capacitor that goes in. This is going to go into pin 5 and whether you use this for a uh, monostable or a stable mode, it doesn't matter. Uh, you always need this capacitor. Uh, what this does is this helps um, if you wanted to use pin 5 to mess with the voltage levels or mess with the actual pulse width, you could feed a voltage in on this. But in typical a stable or monostable mode, a lot of people don't use those. So uh, normally you'll just see coming off of pin 5 a capacitor going to ground. The last connection you're going to want to make is you're going to need to run a wire from pin 6 to pin 2. To indicate that, I'm just going to draw a little box here indicating that this is going to pin 2 and that pin 2 connected up to pin 6. All right, so let's figure out exactly uh, what's going on here. We're going to pretend that this circuit is just turned on. It's just starting to power up. So initially what's going to happen is this thing is going to start to charge up this capacitor. So you've got 9 volts going through these two resistors. It's starting to charge up this capacitor. So we'll say that you know the voltage is really, really low and it's just initially getting that kick. Over here, so that means that this capacitor is charging. Over here on pin 2, uh, we have voltage coming in here as well. The rest of the circuit, this uh, voltage is coming in. You have, a, a nine, you have 9 volts coming into pin 8. It's being divided. Uh, three different spots here. You have a resistor and you have a point tapping this resistor here. So this is the 2 thirds voltage point. So this is 2 thirds of uh, 9 volts, which is 6 volts. And then down here you have another point being tapped off, which is the one third voltage point. So there is 3 volts that is popping into here. So at the very moment this turns on, V0 is less than V plus. So this is going to produce a 1. Right, so we have a, a 1 that's produced on R. Over here at this other comparator, this 9 volt source is busy charging up this capacitor. So V plus is fairly low, though V minus actually wins the day. So this is going to produce a zero. So R equals one, S equals zero. So the thing that gets produced out, since R equals one and S equals zero, is a zero. This nine volt source will continue to charge this capacitor. This output stage reads this as a zero. And the output stage of a 555 timer works kind of in the reverse that you think. When the output stage gets a zero from the flip-flop, then the output stage will output voltage at that time. So what we're going to see is that when the flip-flop equals zero, then the voltage is going to be high. So at the top of this waveform. Um, what this voltage actually equals is the output voltage is going to be at 9 volts minus 1.7 volts approximately. Uh, it actually depends a little bit on the current draw but that's what you uh, can generally end up getting. So the circuit continues to charge though. This 9 volt battery has been charging this capacitor. At some point this 9 volt battery is going to get to a point where this capacitor is charged up greater than two-thirds. Right? Our comparator over here, what it's been doing is as long as V minus is at two-thirds of this nine volt value, then it continues to push a, a zero down this line. Eventually we're going to get to the point where this V plus input is going to be greater than that two-thirds of nine volts, which is six volts, and we're going to produce a one out of here. So let's say that happens. Our capacitor is charged up. Let's say it gets to you know seven volts. That's much greater than six volts. So this produces a one. So S equals one. At that same time, that means that pin two over here, over here, is going to equal uh, 
some value greater than 6 volts as well and that means that V minus then becomes greater than V plus so the comparator outputs a zero so in this case S equals 1 R equals 0 so our flip-flop is going to output a 1 in this case. When it outputs a 1, our output stage, like I said, it operates in reverse. Our output stage is not going to output voltage anymore. Instead, what it's going to do is it's going to take pin 3 and it's going to connect it to ground. All right, so you went from sourcing voltage and now what you're doing is you're sinking voltage. Things just went completely backwards. So in this case, when the flip-flop equals 1, then that voltage out is going to be going to give you the low for this. Something else happens when we get our low. The flip-flop, the output of that one, that one also comes up along this line, comes over to this transistor and turns this transistor on. This allows current to flow now to ground, which means our capacitor over here will start to discharge through RB and into ground until our capacitor is drained. So now pin 6 goes from two-thirds of the source voltage and starts to drain into ground. How fast it drains into ground and how fast that transition occurs is going to be dependent on how big RB and RA are, uh, mainly RB. So how long this thing stays in a certain state very much dependent on RB and RA because when the value is high over here, it depends on how long it takes this source to charge the capacitor. When it's low over here, it depends on how long this capacitor can discharge through RB. As soon as the capacitor drops below one third of the source voltage, now we're gonna do it all over again and we're gonna start over recharging the capacitor. So you can see that this behavior is just gonna continue over and over again. We've got capacitor C that's going to be charged up through RA and RB and that's going to take some time uh, while that's charging up our uh, output is going to be in a certain state as soon as we get to a certain state it's just going to discharge through here again it's going to change the state in the output and then we get this cyclical output that just goes up down up down up down and we can control how fast that happens with a formula. So what this says is the frequency or how fast this output goes up and down is equal to 1.44 and then you divide that by RA plus 2 times RB and then multiply that whole thing by the capacitor value. This is going to give you an output that's in a value called Hertz. All this value means is how many times this phenomenon is going to happen per second. So if it comes out to be 4 Hertz then you're going to have this up and down uh, rotation happening four times a second. Now one of the things I've done for my project is I took this value RB and actually made it an adjustable uh, resistor or potentiometer and that way I can change the value of RB on the fly so I could get a blink rate that goes really fast or I could increase that resistance and get a blink rate that goes really slow. Now the one thing I haven't addressed yet is how uh, pin 3 is actually turning these LEDs on and off because uh, in any given moment pin 3 could be giving voltage out or it could also be connected to ground. So there are two ways pin 3 can operate. Next time I'll show you a very easy way how we can make pin 3's output control uh, in a more indirect way things like an LED turning off and on. A couple things before I go, if you go to the Skinny R&D website, I have network tap kits that are available. If you would like one of those, I'll leave the link here or down in the description, wherever you're watching this, Facebook or on uh, YouTube. Second thing, if you like the lens detector project that I showed you earlier and you think that might be a worthwhile kit that you guys might want, let me know down in the comments. And I've got a few prototypes here um, but I think I could make them a little bit better if you guys decide that you would want them as a kit. Thirdly, uh, let me know if this tutorial made sense. If there's something I need to correct or something didn't quite make sense or that you thought, well, that doesn't sound quite right, just let me know down in the comments. I would love to make these things better and to make them to where you guys uh, can get the information that you need. All right, uh, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.